Let's get back to the disappearance of dissident Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi from the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. That case has raised serious questions about the darker side of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's campaign for reform in the kingdom. That attempt to sort of rebrand Saudi Arabia has been accompanied by a crackdown on dissent, along with enthusiasm backing from the Trump administration and other Western governments, at least until now. Right. Well, for more, we're joined in studio by Smadar Perry. She writes frequently on the Middle East for the Israeli daily Yediot Achronot. And she knew Jamal Khashoggi personally, and we'll hear about that. But first, let's go to Washington and speak with Thomas W. Lippman. He is a non-resident fellow at the Middle East uh, uh, Institute. And let me just start with you, Thomas, because you wrote a book that almost seems prophetic now, the title, Saudi Arabia on the Edge, the Uncertain Future of an American Ally. Talk about that alliance between Riyadh and Washington and how this incident is going to impact on it. Well, the alliance between Riyadh and Washington has been in existence for about 75 years, and it's always been strictly transactional. The Saudi people and the American people have nothing in common, culturally, religiously, socially, uh, temperamentally even. And so the two countries have always maintained this alliance because each has something, has always has something that the other one wanted. And so there have been many times in these 75 years when one side has done something or adopted a policy that infuriated the other. But in the end, the relationship has always survived because both countries found it useful. And I believe that's what I, what's going to happen this time. Do you think then that there should be a line? Certainly this wouldn't be the first time that the Saudi royal family has uh, disappeared a dissident. Uh, this time around, should there be a line? Is there a red line at which point at least publicly some sort of uh, serious action needs to be taken like has been suggested, for example, by some U.S. congressmen? Well, it, the question is who's going to draw that line? How long is it going to last? And what is your objective in drawing it? If you draw that line because you think that Mohammed bin Salman will wake up tomorrow a different or a chastened person, you're wasting your time. What's happening now in Washington is that everybody is looking for some way to appear righteous without actually doing anything that would damage the relationship with all that it means for both countries. Uh, one quick follow-up on that. Uh, some uh, analysts are, are describing the situation now as being sort of created by the Trump administration and that we see the war in Yemen, we see uh, the actions taken uh, against Qatar, for example, and no uh, consequences coming from the United States from this administration, and that Mohammed bin Salman has sort of felt that he has a get-out-of-jail-free card from the White House. Do you agree with that? Well, I think to a certain extent the United States has been um, less than diligent in analyzing and understanding its own interests and seeing how what the Saudis are doing affect those. There's no doubt, for example, that this ridiculous boycott of Qatar has interfered with the United States strategic planning throughout the Gulf. Uh, and there's been the White House has been very unwilling to challenge Mohammed bin Salman on this partly because he has lined himself up in opposition to Iran, and partly because he flattered President Trump. Uh, Smadar, I certainly want to give you the chance to respond or expound on some of the things we've just heard. But I also maybe thought you knew the man, Jamal Khashoggi. Yes, an I knew him. An exceptional relationship for a prominent Israeli journalist. Describe your relationship with him and describe the man. I knew him when he was in Saudi Arabia, mm. meaning until last year. And he is, I knew, of course, when I saw him, I knew exa exactly who he is. But he is the one who came near to me and asked me to meet with him. And he left the, the group that he was with. And uh, it started once and twice. It, it started in Egypt and then in Qatar and then in Europe. And uh, he wanted to know a lot about Israel. This, this was his main idea. And, of course, in my, in my turn, I asked him about Saudi Arabia. And what, what's your impression? Give us just a thumbnail of the man, your impression. Uh, I, th I thought that he belongs to the regime. This is number one. And he belonged. And number two, I thought that he, he was uh, with the Muslim Brothers. At that time, although he was in Saudi Arabia and for a long time was considered to be very yes. close to the royal family before he sort of switched sides, so to speak, did he ever portray any sort of concern about how his words were being watched or what he can do or cannot do in Saudi Arabia? No, because he, he always had a boss with him. 
So he was doing my, his meetings with me, for example, as a service to his boss. It was uh, once it was a prince, and then it was a minister. His and boss then, meeting the royal family, someone yes, within yes. the Saudi. And he was collecting the, the information, and I knew, and he knew, so it was very open, uh, uh, open game. But now that he, I mean, the last year that he decided, uh, or he, he was pushed out of uh, Saudi Arabia, and this was a different game. And I think, then, what I hear from other people, that he was trying to, to organize a, 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 at least one or two sects uh, outside uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, with people who share the same ideas with him. He's a very nice person, by the way. Thomas, Jamal Khashoggi sort of turn from somebody close to the royal family to dissident happened alongside the rise of Mohammed bin Salman. And now you hear some congressmen saying Mohammed bin Salman needs to be on his way out. This isn't a ruler we can deal with. Uh, do you agree with that? Or does he fall in line with the sort of vision you've described of a Saudi Arabia that has always differed dramatically in values from the U.S., but that still can work with Washington? It doesn't matter what I think or what anyone in Washington thinks about Mohammed bin Salman uh, individually. The Saudis have their own way of doing things. They are not much amenable to input from outsiders on how they organize their government or how the royal family makes its choices. And since he is running the country at the moment, no one outside the royal family has any idea of what the dynamics are inside it. And so for the moment, he's the man in charge and we have to deal with him. Uh, Smadar, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was asked by one of our reporters the other day about this case. He basically didn't want to touch it. But it seems- I'm sure he's watching it, smiling and uh, taking it into consideration. In consideration, but in a sense, Israel, and he's in a similar position with President Trump because uh, Mohammed bin Salman is doing things that certainly Jerusalem uh, appreciates now, and yet it goes ahead and does, uh, is, is that a kind of devil's bargain that, that the Netanyahu government, that Israel is going to have to make with this leader who may be moving closer to Israel? I don't think that Israel will, uh, will function independently. Okay. They need to be with the Americans and whatever will be decided uh, with Trump, who is consulting with Netanyahu, this is uh, what's going to happen. On that note, during the time that you were in contact with him, how did Jamal Khashoggi view Israel, or how did his view evolve during his conversations he, with you? He was learning Israel. It was very interesting for him. He didn't know what we, he will do with the information, but he took the time to, to learn Israel, and this is why I think it was important for him to meet with me. And Thomas, let me just go back to you. Uh, you said basically the Saudis are going to do what they want. But let me ask you, if Washington were to press them, there has been talk about, for example, resurrecting the oil weapon of the 1970s, even though, of course, uh, uh, the uh, map of world oil has changed considerably since then. How much of a possible threat or not would be something like that? I think it's out of the question. First of all, the United States no longer imports much oil from Saudi Arabia. Uh, second, Saudi Arabia, even with all its oil power, Saudi Arabia can't do that on its own. There's too much oil flowing out of non-OPEC countries, including Russia. And third, Saudi Arabia can't afford a disruption of the oil market because it's short of money as it is. Thomas, you describe Saudi Arabia as a country that, well, they will do whatever they want. But has that not changed a little bit under Mohammed bin Salman? I mean, you have Davos in the desert happening again in just a couple of weeks. He's banking on having big-time Western names show up there and help him create a sort of rebranded, modernized kingdom. Well, he's trying to modernize the kingdom in terms of its economy and its industrial output because the Saudis know the oil age is coming to an end. They're not going to run out of oil, they're going to run out of customers. But that has nothing to do with the way the country runs its own affairs. Somebody, One of you described Mohammed as a reformer. He's not, and he even said he's not. What he's interested in doing is having people be employed and bring as much prosperity to the country as he can without any change in the political system or any challenge to the political system. In that respect, it's like China. Asmadar, you've traveled extensively throughout 
the Middle East. How do you think the other countries are going to react or not to this? Especially, already, focused, especially focused on Turkey, which uh, is acting as if this is a breach of its sovereignty, but in the end of the day may take a different I approach. I think that Erdogan is looking at in one direction, which is America, which is the Washington, which is Trump. And uh, it's not uh, just by, by co coincidence that he released uh, the pastor, uh, Andrew Bonson. Uh, so they're, they're looking to the U.S. for cues? Of course. And it's all a question now of in, uh, economic interest. That's it. Trump know ex knows exactly what happened. And uh, also Erdogan knows exactly what happened. But they, they prefer to close their eyes and uh, that's it. Yeah, a, a realistic view of the world.